Good morning. It is nice to be here on a warm, sunny morning.
and it's called Speak, O Lord. <coughs> God, we just give you praise and thanks. You have chosen to be our God. You have chosen us to be your people, and we are honored. Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for a spell of dry weather and warmth as we enjoy the sunshine. We do pray for those who are in harm's way, whose weather is not calm and beautiful, especially those facing all the tornadoes in the Midwest and sometimes known as the Tornado Alley. Be with those who have lost their homes. Give them courage and strength for each day. Be with the families of so far few, and we hope it remains that way, who have lost their lives, or for those who have been injured, bring quick healing and recuperation. Lord, we do pray for our church, and at this time we are mindful to pray for our whole church, the United Methodist Church and all of its many and varied locations all around the world. The Lord, even bigger, your whole church, wherever people come together to pray, to worship you, to love you, and to serve you by loving their neighbors. Bless your church. Help people realize that it is a place of refuge and sanctuary and love and grace, and that they need a way to connect and to know you more in their lives. 
Be with those places where your church is persecuted and give those believers your strength and your courage to continue following you day by day. We give you thanks that there are so many more treatments available for various health conditions that we might live longer and stay well longer and or return and resume to our normal lives. We do lift those who grieve to you for your comfort, for your peace, and for the hope that only you can offer. We pray for those who need your healing touch, those who fell, those who are dealing with various assorted health issues, bring your healing, bring adjustments as needed, do all in your power that is so beyond any other power to make them well and strong once again. We give thanks for our thoughtful children and ask that you be with Paul and Cynthia and their family this weekend, that they have had a blessed weekend and might re return back to us refreshed. Lord, we know that sometimes you walk with us in ways we are not expecting. Sometimes our eyes don't quite see you at first. So we ask that as we go into this week, we might be looking for you with new eyes. That we might see you in the eyes of our friends, our family, and our neighbors. We thank you once again that Jesus Christ came, lived our life, died our death, and was risen from the dead, that we might know that he is alive and he is with us. And as we praise you for all of his wonderful, graceful, saving work, it is in his name that we pray. And as we follow his lead, we pray the prayer he gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so again, it's on that Easter Sunday, that first Easter Sunday. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some woman of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when the, they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. 
Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things, and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed the bread, broke the bread, gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. We have to get a sense Jesus kind of had fun suddenly showing up to these disciples and then going ahead and vanishing because it sure seems to happen several times in the stories of the disciples first saw him. Before this passage, the writer of Luke in this chapter tells the story of the woman going to the tomb and finding it empty. They saw the messengers from God, the angels in glowing white, who told them, Jesus is not here, he is risen. When the woman went and told the other disciples, only, Jesus, or only Peter went to the tomb to check it out. And the scripture says, seeing that Jesus wasn't there, he went home. Apparently, he wasn't the only one who headed home. We hear about these two disciples who headed out on a road that would take them to a village called Emmaus. It is believed that Emmaus was about seven miles from Jerusalem, so it was a pretty good day's journey when you're walking. We don't know much else about them. One is called Cleopas. Many have come to think the other might be a woman, maybe his wife, maybe another disciple traveling with him. And they head towards Emmaus, what we think might be their home. There's two things that have stuck in my mind about this passage for a long time. A preacher wrote kind of poem, sermons, devotional about this. There's two different things that he says in his writing about this that just really stick. And one is the question of why they're going to Emmaus. He describes Emmaus as the place you go when there seems to be nowhere else to go. When your hopes and dreams have been broken, when you have given up, when your head hurts, when your heart hurts, perhaps you head towards Emmaus. Another phrase of his is one he puts into one of these disciples' mouths as they walked along. We had hoped, they say in the Bible, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem all Israel. And he has them kind of saying to each other, I had hoped. I had so hoped. And you just imagine the other disciples sighing and nodding past the law in their throat. How about we all had a life experience that left us feeling that maybe our hope was gone? Maybe we prayed hard for someone to be healed and they were healed by resurrection instead of earthly healing. Maybe an issue was passed or a political party won and the impact of it frightens us. Maybe it is what challenge that we face here, being part of a small church congregation in which many hours of energy and many years been invested and we're still small. Maybe it is the break or the death of a personal relationship, a romantic one, a family one, or a friendship. 
Maybe it's the loss of a job that was rewarding and fulfilling, or the reality that a new job or position isn't going to be as wonderful as you sounded, as you've gotten to know it each time or day. It could be a health diagnosis that will take some dealing with or adapting to a new normal. I had hoped. I had so hoped, we say. So we turn our steps away from the crowds that populated Jerusalem and the city and turn towards our Emmaus. Sometimes these journeys are the ones that seem the longest as our steps lay. We are dispirited, unenergized, so we might walk even more slowly than usual. I think it's harder to imagine today as we so often travel by car. But when people walk to their destinations, I imagine it was easy for camaraderie to spread up with those you walked similar pace with along the road. And so it wasn't unusual for a stranger to kind of come along with you and join in. And it was certainly safer than traveling alone. Last Sunday, I took a friend from high school that we have kind of recently reconnected. She lives in Lebanon and works in Wilmington, so we could meet in the middle, and found out she's a birder also. So we've been out Saturday morning. Well, I got home Sunday afternoon. It was one of those Sunday afternoons when I kind of wanted a nap. I had slept all the night before. I wasn't sleepy, but I wasn't really awake, and I'm kind of sitting, and I'm trying to get myself moving because I had done this for an hour and a half, two hours. It was time to do something besides sit. And I flipped through Facebook, especially the spring migration is on. I keep an eye on Facebook, and there was a really different bird being seen up in Vandalia, Ohio. Hold up the map where the park is. Oh, it's not even an hour, 15 minutes. Counts as not an hour when you're a bird. Not even an hour away. I had several chores I had planned to do, some phone calls I had intended to make. I knew she has been working very, very long hours, and she had some things to do at day home, but I texted her anyway and said, hey, there's this really cool baby bird. My phone rings almost before the text was sent with that. Like, she said, well, what is it and where are we going? Can we meet somewhere? I said, she's never really done what we call a chase when we go after a bird that we want to see that's not just in one of our usual spots. I have several times. Some of them I've gotten, some of them I haven't. They have wings and they don't always stay where they're reported. So we decided Waynesville would be a good place to meet to get on 75 and go on up the road. And we did. This particular bird, by the way, it's called a white white tail. Okay, very few of them occasionally go to Alaska when they migrate. They live in Europe, in Iceland, and places like that. They don't live in you. This bird is really, really lost. So we decided it was rare enough. We were going to go. And she drove, and we got up to the park, and we didn't have the park. I had a map, but it didn't have their street names marked. And we had been looking at a different parking lot. We had missed one on this side, which is where it turned out we needed to be when we went in. So we were asking strangers, where's this road? Where's this? And I put it back on Facebook, and somebody finally gave me directions, and we got there. And it was a good walk back. It was back a paved bike trail through a gravel dirt road in through a cornfield to where there was a puddle to see this bird. Why I'm telling you all this is because it was a fun walk. We started talking almost immediately to a assume man and woman couple um, burgers, and they were from Geauga County, which if you were like me and went to SeaWorld, you could get it out. SeaWorld as a kid, as Geauga, it's not real close. You know, they had driven, I think they said three and a half hours to come chase this bird. So we were chatting with them. My friend was so excited. She's my height, or even a little less, a little shorter. She kept zipping up and looking back, like, oh, I left them again, until she had some definite adrenaline bumping. And as other people were coming, they said, hey, there's also some neat sparrows over there, too. Don't miss those, even though you, we know you can't see the white tail. The white tail's still there, just this camaraderie that develops. You see, by the binoculars, the cameras, the scopes, that other people are after this bird. 
And so it just was a lot of fun because that's part of the fun of it is the camaraderie. It's not just, it's cool to see the bird, but it's not just about seeing the bird, it's about seeing the bird and sharing that with others. Um, as we came back, we were talking with a young man who was going home from Purdue on spring break, may or may not have been, I'm not sure where home was, on his way, and he was young. He might yet go chase another bird on the way that they were seeing somewhere in Indiana <laughs> before he gets back to Purdue. So I'm not sure when he made it back, if he made it back to Purdue. His excuse is he is an ornithology of the ones who study birds major, so he had an excuse. And we would have had a good day had we not gotten to see the bird, but we did get to see the bird. In fact, we got to see both of the birds, and both of them were light birds, as we call them for her. The white tail for me was the other sparrows I had seen once. But it, like, there were probably 50 and 60 people moving at a time to watch this bird. And that's what I wanted to lift, thinking about this walk to Emmaus. There's the stranger comes along and they're telling him about what happens and their disappointment that they thought he was gone and not sure because it probably wasn't as unnatural as in some ways it sounds. And we did, like I said, our journey was successful. We did get to see the bird. But sometimes journeys can lead us to places that aren't as exciting or more difficult, because life can break our hearts and our hopes. So we journey in one way or another to the place where we go when we don't know where to go. The place we go when we don't have anywhere else to go. And sometimes that stranger comes alongside, listening to our concerns, sharing some insights we had maybe not considered. Sometimes when you're too close to the situation, you can lose sight of the big picture. They might point out just what God has said and promised through the scriptures. Sometimes our hearts and our hearts are broken and in breaking apart, we might grow in our faith, we might grow closer to God. To putting ourselves back together, we might be more fully alive in Christ and Christ might be more fully alive in us. There's a very ancient text that's called The Dark Night of the Soul, written by John of the Cross. It was written in the 1500s. And he had a struggle in his life of where he was to be. And the, he was actually, if I get the story right, kept a prisoner for nine months when he felt called to leave where he was supposed to be as a monk and go to a different monastery. Sounds pretty strict to me, but in that darkness, he wasn't sure he was experiencing God. And then finally, as he prayed, and he realized he was being freed from some other attachments in this life, he was able to grow back in faith and closeness to God. And it has become a well-known, not an easy to read text because it's translated in from an older time. But over and over, other spiritual teachers have learned and taught that when we have these times of trial, they can become times of growth in faith. And they use that image of being in the dark, being in the night, being like a seed or a bulb that's under the ground and has to break apart for new life to grow from it, to grow into the plant that it was intended. A story that came to my mind, or for several as I was thinking about this this morning, is that of a church history professor at Duke University. Her name is Kate Bowler. She was in her early 30s. She and her husband were trying to have their first child. I think they had had trouble getting pregnant, and then maybe she had miscarried, and they finally were happily, healthily pregnant at four or five months old. She landed in the ER with and her system, and they found out she had fourth stage colon cancer. So, of course, they can't treat the cancer while she's carrying the baby. And very soon after the baby was born, they found and they hunted, and they found that there was an experimental treatment that in Atlanta, Georgia, they lived in, they were at Duke, so that's 
North Carolina. So she needed to travel to Atlanta once a week for these treatments. And as many cancer treatments do, they took a toll. And she was weak and sick. She didn't know if she would get to see her baby's first birthday, and then his six month birthday, or get to see him turn one year old. And as she dealt with all these experiences to do with the cancer and cancer treatment, she began to look at the world somewhat differently than many others around her. She found that sometimes we tend to put this brave, cheerful, bright face on and say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, or God is with me, when we really need to say, no, life stinks. Life hurts, I'm not doing well right now. I'm not sure why this has happened. So her book titles are wonderful. She wrote about these experiences. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the current experiences. She has survived. She is right now cancer-free. She was on one of the um, leadership clinics with our bishop. It's the first time I had seen her heard her voice other than reading him. She's just very personable. Lives with a lot of pain. She doesn't deny that partially. She, there was something that happened even before the cancer that some, I don't even remember what it was to do with, but she had issues with moving her arms and stuff, so she's got something else going on in her body as well. But her book titles say so much in themselves. Here's one of the first book that she came out with. Everything happens for a reason and other lies that I have loved. There are so many things that we say without really thinking deeply about what they say, and she calls us on that. And then her next book is There's No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. She's a very real, authentic writer in what she shares and how she shares it. And she says, we come to the realization, sooner or later, terrible things can happen to us just because we're human. Being Christian does not protect us from the things that happen in life. But she has come to believe and teach at sharing truth with each other, and even being honest with God in our prayers can help us draw close to God, even while knowing that sometimes things are just terrible. And she obviously, as I said, has lived that. She's not writing advice she does not know. She was living in extreme pain as a result of the cancer treatments, which led her having to not be able to do some of her scholarship, but to she writes some short devotionals and prayers. And again, her titles, some of the devotionals in her latest book are When Everything is Out of Control, Not Your Best Self, To Feel Wonder Again, um, To See a Beautiful Day, and When It's Not Fair, It Really Isn't. That's the whole title. Because sometimes life is not. And so she writes, there are days we know we're going to have terrible days, for one reason or another. There are days we have terrible days whether we know ahead or not, but they can still be beautiful. And so here's a blessing that she wrote for a terrible, beautiful day, which by the way is her book title. It said, blessed are we the anxious, with eyes wide open to the lovely and the awful. Blessed are we the aware knowing that the only sane thing to do in such a world is to admit the fear that sits in our peripheral vision. Blessed are we the hopeful eyes searching for the horizon, ready to meet the next miracle, the next surprise. Yes, blessed are we the grateful as we awake to this beautiful, terrible day. In the midst of terrible things, Life is still beautiful. A child laughs, the sun shines, a friend walks with us, and Christ is present. When you think Jesus is gone, when you head towards the place you go where there seems nowhere else to go, sometimes, suddenly, there's a stranger walking with you. You invite them to share a meal, which would have been unheard of at that time to not do, but 
since the scripture says they strongly urged him, apparently they were even more sincere about it than usual. And then the characteristic taking, blessing, breaking, and sharing the bread, you realize it is the living Christ that has been walking with you. He walked with the disciples on that road to Emmaus, and Jesus walks with us today. Even in those times when we are feeling as if hope has been taken away from us. When we sigh, I had so hoped. Even in those times when things are terrible, truly terrible, that we practice our faith. We believe without seeing. We make the choice to trust, to believe that Jesus, the risen Christ, is with us. Sometimes it takes reaching out and clinging, clinging to Christ, clinging to the faith. Looking back and seeing where God has blessed us in the past, that we might trust that God will bless us in the future. We make that choice to act in love, to look for beauty. And at some point, our eyes are open and we see Jesus is walking with us. Jesus has walked with us all along. May we have eyes to see beauty in the dark night, in the midst of terrible things, and to find that even there, Jesus walks with us to offer us new hope and courage.